Good morning. Welcome to the uh, session on measuring climate change and impacts. And uh, we'll start right into this. Our first speaker of the session is Anthony Watts. Anthony is a 25-year broadcast meteorology veteran and chief, currently chief meteorolo meteorologist for KPAY AM radio. In 1987, he founded IT Works, which supplies broadcast graphic systems to hundreds of cable television, television and radio stations nationwide. In 2007, he founded surfacestations.org, a website devoted to photographing and documenting the quality of weather stations across the United States. As many of you know him best, he's editor of the terrific blog, What's Up With That? That's one of the two that I look at all the postings and is the best climate change blog in the world, in my opinion. <laughs> and somehow, with all these efforts in play, uh, Anthony still finds time to publish in the scientific liter literature. So uh, with no further comments, please welcome Anthony Watts. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to talk about uncertainty in the surface temperature record, some of the things that I've found through my investigations over the past few years. And um, we have uh, a number of different examples. We have uncertainty in the measurements themselves done by human observers. We have uncertainty in the adjustments associated with the data that's being recorded. We have uncertainty associated with UHI, the urban heat island effect. And we have uh, homogenization, something where we're taking data from dissimilar stations and combining them together to create trends. And finally, we have station siting, which of course is my specialty, and I'm going to be talking about that a little bit too. First, let's talk about the measurements themselves. There's three different kinds of measurements that are made that are done with the U.S. Weather Bureau mercury thermometers. This has gone back to 1890 when the Weather Bureau was first formed. They all have a resolution of 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit. The MMTS, the newer electronic thermometer introduced around 1985, has that same resolution along with the memory for highs and lows. And of course then there's the airport weather stations, the ASOSs and the AWOS stations, which also have a resolution of 0 0.1. But the interesting thing is, is that uh, when these things are recorded on the forms used to report for climate, the NOAA B91 and E15 forms, these values are not retained. They are tossed out and rounded to the nearest whole degree Fahrenheit. And in addition, as you can see there on this example uh, of a form, uh, that the numbers are recorded in whole numbers as opposed to numbers in tenths. And in addition to that, the observers themselves are not always doing data every day. Um, a lot of these stations are placed at locations where they're volunteer observers or where it's an office, like a fire station, a police station, a ranger station, or whatever. And so there's missing data, weekends, holidays, sick leave, things like that. There's lots of chunks of missing data that we found in the reports of climate over the past century. This is just one example. So. There's a standard for all of this. They specify, the Weather Bureau and later the NOAA, specified that uh, they are to round up, take from the nearest tenth of degree and uh, round it up, for example. 4.5 becomes 5. So that resolution of 0 0.1 degrees Fahrenheit is discarded. Now, people say the law of large numbers takes care of that. Well, perhaps, but it still introduces an uncertainty into the entire surface temperature record of plus or minus a half a degree Fahrenheit. So in the adjustments associated with the data, there's also uncertainty. And this is from the Federal Meteorological Handbook number one, uh, basically saying uh, that the rounding should become a two. So the rounding rule introduces a small bias itself. They don't do a, a round odd even uh, or out of the, any other of the tie-breaking methods, they always do a roundup. So because they're doing a roundup, this introduces a very, very small uh, temperature bias. And for example, if you just use three, comp three numeric components, you get a, a bias of about .0005. Well, add that to a lot of stations, and it starts adding up a little bit more. So this asymmetry in the way that rounding is done is one of the small biases that is in the surface temperature record. And then there's the adjustments to the surface temperature record for all the different problems associated with measurement. 
There's the time of observation bias. There's something called fill net. There's shop. There's all these different adjustments to account for the fact that the surface temperature network is imperfect for the job of measuring climate. And this is well documented and well understood. So they have a number of adjustments that have to be applied. You can see a, a number of them here separately that are introduced in this graph that's done by NOAA. And then here is the sum total of adjustments up to the year 2000. This graph is from NOAA's uh, USHCN website. So as you can see, there's a significant amount of adjustment added to the surface temperature record. Now, a lot of folks say, well, this is entirely justified, and there have been scientific papers written on it and so forth. We recently had another fellow uh, by the name of uh, Zeke Hausfather that has uh, done a graph, and he showed that he thought that the uh, work that was done with BEST in checking these things was justified and that the adjustments were, were necessary and real. But the fact is, is that it adds this, these adjustments about 45 hundredths of a degree centigrade, or 0.81 Fahrenheit, to the entire surface temperature record for the United States. And most of that adjustment is in the last 50 years. So we've got a number of uncertainties associated with station siding. Now, it's said that these are taken care of by all these different adjustments and so forth. Me, I'm not so sure. I want to show you some examples. Of course, everyone's seen this one by now. This is the famous uh, weather station in the parking lot at Tucson, Arizona, at the University of Arizona. And uh, this one here was actually closed shortly after we highlighted it. Closed for climate purposes. They still have the station, but it's no longer in the climate record. And we have this one here at Hanksville, Utah, where we have the weather station sited over a gravestone. That's a pioneer woman that's buried there. And um, they put the station over the gravestone because the curator got tired of tripping over the thing at night when he went out to do the measurements, so they just put the thing over the gravestone. So you've got this instant heat sink right there. And uh, here's another famous one, Lampasas, Texas. Used to be outside of town, but they moved it. The observer got sick and could no longer do the work, and so they had to move the station. They moved it in town right next to the highway there, and you can see the, uh, the hardware store down the street. Uh, this is a radio station. Problem was, is when they moved it, they introduced a tremendous change in the way that that station was recording temperature. And you can see it there at the end of the graph, a huge step function associated with that temperature move, or with that station move, increased the temperature. But the interesting thing is, is that the homogenization process that all these stations go through actually made the problem worse. Instead of taking out that step function, they actually made the problem worse by increasing the trend. They cooled the past with the homogenization process, as you can see here. And as in cooling the past, increased the trend without fixing the problem in the first place. And so this leaves you to wonder how accurate and how representative is the surface temperature record. It's something that I've been looking at for the last five years. One of the things that is also under consideration, and a lot of folks look at UHI. Now, there are studies out that say, well, UHI doesn't have a significant factor. I believe it does. This particular study here was an eye-opener for me in 1996. James Goodridge, the former state climatologist of California, published in the Bulletin of the American Meteorological Society, his paper. And here he showed three different graphs. These were counties in California of varying populations, of over a million, around 100,000, or less than 100,000. And it struck me, because I thought to myself, if CO2 were, in fact, causing these temperature rises, how would it know to warm these counties differently? It's not an intelligent molecule. And so this clearly was one of the first instances where UHI had been documented associated with population density. And we continue to study UHI today. You can see this is a curve of UHI that might look uh, a schematics, if you will, over a city. That uh, the closer you get to the the higher density of heat sinks and so forth, the higher the temperature. And I've actually measured this myself. In Reno, Nevada, I did a transect using my vehicle with a special attachment that I had on my uh, passenger window, which had a sensor and a radiation shield. And I drove through Reno one night on a clear night with uh, still air. And I was actually able to measure this transect, in this transect, a tremendous amount of UHI in this city. Yet, where you see the little yellow dot down there in the lower part of the screen, that's where the airport is, and that's where the USHCN's climate station's record is at, right in the middle of the UHI. Does that affect things? I believe it does. Then we've got this study from Zhang et al. of 2010. It says that, uh, I'm having a little trouble reading here, mainly because the monitor's down there, it's so small, but it says, uh, the summer land surface temperature in cities 
uh, in the Northeast were an average of 7 degrees to 9 degrees centigrade higher or warmer than surrounding areas. And they did this by looking at data from satellites, from the MODIS satellite, looking at uh, temperatures, land use changes, and so forth. This is Buffalo, New York, and then here is Providence, Rhode Island. And if you can see, there's a significant amount of buildup from these cities, uh, land use changes, and the infrared photography indicates a temperature difference with the surrounding countryside. So they found significant jumps in temperature associated with these cities, and they believe that UHI is real. The question is, does it affect the long-term trends of things? And I believe it does. In fact, I can talk about Chicago in that context. Many of you have flown into Chicago O'Hare Airport to come here. The identifier on your luggage tags is ORD. That does not stand for O'Hare. It stands for Orchard Field, which is what it was way back in the 40s when aviation was young and there were grass fields and so forth. It was literally Orchard Field. It was a much more rural environment, but they still measure temperature there. And so the environment changed around the thermometer. And now we have this megaplex of uh, runways and tarmacs and buildings and so forth, which is Chicago O'Hare, but they still measure the temperature there. In Australia, the Bureau of Meteorology has found that they have uh, seen that UHI is an issue in this publication on October 13th of 2010. And uh, unfortunately, I can't read it all, so I'll just let you folks read it. I apologize for that. I, the monitor is too small for me, and I didn't bring my glasses. UHI and homogenization is kind of like mixing bowls of muddy water. This is my view of it to help you understand it. If you have a number of different bowls of water, one clean, which represents a pure temperature signal, and one dirty, muddy water, which might represent a, a muddy signal from a city that's been UHI affected or a siting affected, when homogenization is done, all the data from these different sites is mixed together to create a new value, which is like what we saw at Lampasas. And so it's kind of like mixing muddy water together. So what's the end result? a mixture. And is that representative of what the climate is? I don't think it is. And UHI is not dealt with appropriately in the record. Only five one hundredths of a degree centigrade to the uh, adjustment of the record associated with uh, adjustments. There's a whole forty-five hundredths. It's only a small offset. We believe it should be more, me and my colleagues. So here's what we know so far. We, uh, from my paper last year, Fall et al. 2011, we found that uh, there was, in fact, an effect from siting associated with uh, bad station siting and so forth. And temperature trend estimates vary according to the site classification, with poor siting leading to an overestimate of minimum temperature trends and an underestimate of maximum temperature trends. Also a change in the diurnal temperature range. According to the diurnal temperature range, there's no century scale trend in the best stations. Temperature trends estimates uh, indeed vary according to the site classification. Minimum temperature warming trends are overestimated at poorer sites. Maximum temperature trends are under, underestimated at poorer sites. And then there's T average, which is an entirely different story. This is a pie graph of all of the different uh, sightings measurements that we did. And there are only 90, uh, there's only a small amount of stations out there that are compliant according to the NOAA standards of sighting. 92.1% of the U.S. Historical Climatological Network is not compliant at all. This was backed up by a report in the GAO this past summer. They found that uh, there were some significant issues associated with the climate monitoring network backing up my work, but they came up with a different number. Um, they, uh, they found that the number was only about 42%. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit because we're running out of time. Forty-two percent of the active stations did not meet one or more of the siting standards, yet we identified ninety-two percent. Why the difference? Well, the difference is because NOAA went around after we highlighted a lot of these stations and started closing sites. In this publication I did here in 2009, uh, watch 2009, we highlighted sites all over the country. For example, Ardmore, Oklahoma, here's the before and after picture. There's the temperature sensor, that little white thing on a stick right on the street but they removed it after our publication came out. And we found that NOAA went around and started closing or changing the way that the data was being handled to a lot of sites. Here's the MMTS uh, for Lampasas, Texas, and if, according to the metadata, they're saying now the data at this location is marginally suitable due to construction and urbanization, and they're looking for a new observer. They're trying to find a place to put it. So obviously they think the data is bad. 
And there's dozens more. These are just a few examples. One of the most fair, uh, famous ones, Marysville, California, the one that got me started on this path. They've closed that one just a few months after we highlighted it. Now, we've done some additional studies, and I want to show you these because it's uh, part of some of the work we're doing we hope to be able to publish in the, sometime in the future. But what we did is we went and looked at the data again in a different way, uh, using a new technique. This is what NOAA says the United States looks like in terms of temperature trend. The CONUS trend is 0.312 degrees C per decade. This is the adjusted homogenized data. This is the data from non-compliant thermometers, 0.248, without any adjustments, the raw data. And then this is the data associated with compliant thermometers that meet the siting standards, 0.165. These are the new numbers that we've come up with based on our new technique and looking at things a little differently. And I owe, owe some uh, inspiration to uh, Dr. Richard Muller of BEST for some of those ideas. So in summary, there's human error in recording and creating data. There's rounding errors. There's rounding up, which adds a small bias. There's adjustments, accounting for almost half of the signal of warming, homogenization, it ruins the signal from the good stations. There's a long period UHI, which is not dealt with appropriately, we feel. And there's station siting, which we've addressed in Fall at Al and hope to address in a future publication. And then there's the fact that NOAA itself has closed stations and also created the new climate reference network, indicating that even they recognize the issue of uncertainty. Thanks much. Thank you.